Well, greetings, everyone, and uh, thanks for being here with us in in space time and on the internet and in our hearts and minds. So today, again, my name is John Dupuy, and I'm the CEO of iWake Technologies. And today, we're I'm talking with my dearest friends and colleagues, Dr. Bob Weathers. And um, anyway, as you'll soon gather, he's a very special person and brings a lot of medicine to our hurting world. So, um, Bob, greetings. Uh, thank you, John. I'm very touched by your introduction. I love you too. I feel uh, deeply, deeply indebted to you. And our relationship over the last decade has been, um, it's, real, it's right at the heart of what we're talking about today. And we'll be talking more about gratitude, but it's definitely related. I'll say more about you in regards yeah, to gratitude. Well, let me, let me, I, I got ahead of myself, I think. What we're here to do is talk about the new iWake release, the Gift of Gratitude Volume 1. Yeah. with uh bob and and his his transformational transmission if you will about gratitude and uh along with the the tracks that created for this um from the i awake uh, creator so it's a big deal and i've known bob i've known you for quite a while and i've seen you go through stuff and your story is amazing uh and you are you know you had a really hard time and you you've crashed and burned and you picked yourself up and dusted off and were really honest with everybody and just has been a blessing to the world ever since. And that's about as good as we can get in this lifetime, I think. So uh yeah, so so why are we doing this? And 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 I want to hear too from you why gratitude is so important and how that can help us in these these crazy, crazy quick changing uh times that we live in. Yeah, yeah. I'm happy to speak into it, John. Maybe I'll go for a bit and then we can dialogue about it. I'm very interested in, in conversation with you. Um, John, you know uh, that it was uh, 11 years ago that I got into recovery myself from addiction to alcohol and other drugs. That's an open fact. It's on my website. It's the heart of my work as a recovery coach. So you know that. And uh, what was clear to me early on in the work is that I was going to need to find a way to complement all the dark work I was doing. I was in 12-step programs. I was in refuge recovery, which is a Buddhist-oriented approach. And I was working with you with integral recovery. I needed three programs, John, not one. And uh, there was a lot of focus uh, on shadow work. And uh, there still is. There still is. That became the heart of my forgiveness practice. And you and I worked together on a previous I Awake release, the, the Freedom of Forgiveness, which is all about that, which is basically building self-compassion um, in a space where I didn't realize it at the time, but I was living under the cloud of shame uh, that kept me really bound uh, for most of my life. And I yeah. made no excuses. It's just that that was the work that needed to be done. But there needed to be a complementary part, John. And, and, and this that we're talking about today is that complement. Um, it's interesting. Uh, you know this, but maybe some of our listeners know, don't know this. Our, our bodies and brains are, um, they default to a, uh, a, a negative uh, framework. Uh, it's for survival. Darwin was right. <laughs> survival of the fittest is that we do well to have a negative, it's referred to as a negativity bias. And I certainly had that, John. I certainly had that. I had it towards particularly myself. I've most of my life been more generous towards others than I have towards myself. And so the shadow work, the, the forgiveness work, all of that work, which continues to this morning, swimming in the pool, which I'll talk more about, that continues. This could be a lifelong enterprise. But the complementary side was if I, I have a built-in negativity bias as a human being, and then if you take my specific history, which you know more about than most people, there's a plenty of negativity in there, um, it's going to take some some real work to uh, offset or counterbalance that. I like how Carl Jung talked about this. He described the work of individuation, which is his term for becoming a whole self, living in integrity. He said, it's the opus contra naturum, which is Latin, and it's easy enough to break down. You speak Spanish, so it'll be easy for you. Opus is work, like a piece of music, like any of your music is an opus. Contra is the Latin word, as in Spanish, uh, 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 against or counter to. And natorum is the Latin word for nature. So what Jung was saying is the work of becoming a whole self is going upstream. It's the work against nature, the opus contra natorum. And so if my brain 
if the path of least resistance is to move into negativity, and historically that was the case for me, I'm going to have to work like hell to build. I'm going to have to be like the salmon that go upstream to spawn. I'm going to have to build some new pathways in my body and in my brain. And this practice is about that. So uh, I discovered it about a dozen years ago, like actually 11 years ago when I got into recovery. I discovered it, uh, one piece of it, I discovered in the context of uh, Buddhist meditation in uh, my environment. Involvement in Refuge Recovery, which is a complementary um, recovery program, um, along with uh, 12 steps. It, both of them worked hand in hand for me. I was introduced to what they refer to as metta practice. Metta is just the Sanskrit word for compassion. And I'm going to correct myself because it might be the Pali word for compassion, but it's one of those words for compassion. And so it started with loving kindness. It's translated as loving kindness. Uh, towards others. And so it started that way for me in the early days, John. Uh, as with the forgiveness practice, so with the gratitude practice, they've they've morphed and moved and developed through conversations with friends like you. They've developed more heft over the last almost dozen years. And so I've come to call this gratitude practice, which is kind of a extension of the meta practice, the compassion or loving kindness practice from early on. And I practice this every morning as well. I'm going to summarize just a couple of things that I just want to pause for a breath and interact with you, John, is that as with forgiveness practice, uh, the, as soon as the gratitude practice began to take hold, I realized this is going to be non-optional for me. I can't speak for others, but for me. And so over the last 11 years, you'd be hard pressed to find a morning where I haven't practiced one of these. There are mornings that I haven't. You know that I had some uh, pretty major surgery last year on my shoulder, and I missed a couple of weeks there. I was just kind of floating out in the cosmos. <laughs> but outside of that, it's I'm very dedicated to it. I've learned this from you, John, that when the going gets tough, you don't meditate less, you meditate more. Yeah. And so I've had my ups and downs over the last almost dozen years. And I, I tell people this all the time is that these twin practices, forgiveness practice, which is summarized in our work together on freedom of forgiveness, and then this practice, the gift of gratitude, they've been uh, absolutely the bedrock of my own recovery. Now, this particular release is for a general population, which then begs the question, how do we extend or generalize this from somebody who's in addiction recovery? That'll be part two. Uh, to the general population. So let me say a word about that, and then and then uh, we'll move into conversation dialogue. I came across in the last number of years, uh, John, you don't know this, I don't think, because I'd hardly ever talk about it. I came this close to going to UC Davis, which would have been up where you near where you went to school. Um, I, I, I applied to their clinical program. I made a decision at the last moment to, to, uh, to go to uh, Fuller Seminary instead for my uh, studies in, in psychology. Uh, why I chose Fuller is at that point, it was the only game in town. This is before California Institute of Integral Studies, before JFK University, before the, the resources that are out there now. Uh, I wanted to study spirituality and psychology together. My undergraduate degrees were in each other. I got a bachelor's degree in religious studies, a bachelor's degree in psychology. I couldn't see separating those, and it was literally the only game in town. John, you know this story, is by the time I got to Fuller, which is an evangelical Christian seminary, I was neither, uh, at least identifiably. And thank goodness for contemplative practice, which within the first year, I had a real crisis. But yeah, you started out as, as a devout Christian uh, for uh, many years. I did. I, did, I, did. I, I, I figured that I just lost my faith. And the irony is I just started a six-year doctoral program that was equal parts clinical psychology. I was going to get a doctorate in clinical psychology and a master's degree in religious studies. And I can guarantee you that first year or two, I really debated the wisdom of my decision. But I found a way. I found a way there, in, including taking additional courses outside the university. I got to study at Claremont Graduate School with Misawa Bay, who at that point was the heir apparent to D.T. Suzuki in terms of bringing Zen to the West. And I mean, just incredible gifts, opportunities. I met Jim Finley, who's a dear, dear friend. You know Jim. Jim introduced me to contemplative uh, Catholicism. 
Buddhism, his own practice. Jim was equal parts Christian and, and, and Zen. And he and I have been best friends for almost 45 years now. So just really, God looks down on me kindly and has brought me full circle to where I really feel a deep, deep connection, particularly to contemplative uh, Christianity, as I do to any contemplative form. You know my love for Rumi and the Sufis and certainly a deep, deep acquaintanceship with Buddhism and Taoism. It, it's whatever that is at the heart of it. Um, now, where, why did I go there? Well, I, let me say this, you know, uh, we use, we throw around the word contemplative because it's, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, uh, and, and at one point in my life, I'm, what the hell are they talking about contemplative? And, and as I understand it, it means the practice of sing, simply hanging yeah. out in the presence. Yeah. It, more than thinking about it. It's more than theology. It's more than this. It's actually hand, being in the presence of the divine, however that is, uh, that is what uh, said or calculated. It's beautifully said, John. In fact, let me let me link that to where I was going, why I went on that little detour. So I was talking about UC Davis. I want to come full circle. Is that I, I uh, uh, there's a psychologist up at UC Davis. I would have met him if I'd gone to school there. As it turned out, I haven't met him. Bob Emmons by name. He spent his entire career, as a lot of psychologists do, especially researchers, he's been studying one thing for his entire career. We're about the same age. He studied the relationship of gratitude to stress. That's, that's He's written numerous books, countless articles, and just at a real pragmatic level. And he's looking from a psychological perspective. UC Davis, it was not a uh, JFK university, and it's certainly not a Fuller Seminary. It was pure psychology. I'm grateful in hindsight that I went to Fuller because it allowed me to study uh, deeply into the various world religious traditions. Very, very grateful. That wouldn't have happened if I'd gone to UCLA or UC Davis. Those were my two other options. But Bob Emmons has studied gratitude from a psychological perspective and just strictly from a psychological perspective. He says there's very few things that we can do to reduce our, our baseline stress level than practicing daily gratitude. So he's looked at the relationship of thanksgiving or appreciation in our life to how that manages our cortisol and adrenaline levels. Now, so far, that doesn't sound like I'm addressing your comment about <laughs> contemplation. So let's do this. I think it's a different language. You and I are well familiar with Ken, Ken Wilber's aqua model in the upper left-hand quadrant. We can look at any practice, including gratitude practice, strictly psychologically. We can look at it biologically, the upper right-hand quadrant as well. But we can also go more deeply into the upper left-hand quadrant and begin to look at what transforms in terms of our experience of what you talked about in terms of presence into some relationship to something greater than ourselves, something that gives our life meaning and value and purpose. I really see that as the domain of spirituality. And contemplation has to do with this experience. And it's, I have to tell you a real quick story, John. I started practicing, I started reading uh, about Zen my first year in graduate school. That's 1979, 1980. By the summer of 1980, I was sitting in my apartment in Pasadena, and I've told you this story before. I was reading Christmas Humphrey's book, uh, uh, Western Approach to Zen, and it was, I read Thich Nhat Hanh and a number of different, uh, Jack Hornfield. And I put the books down, and I thought, I've got to start reading about this shit and start practicing. And so I, I sidled up next to the, the stucco wall in my living room. I, I didn't know anybody that meditated, certainly not at Fuller. And I, uh, it seemed like a weird thing to do, but I was reading about it. So I put the books down and I can still remember sitting there with my eyes open. I, I, I was just operating as well as I could from what I had read. And for the first time in memory, for so extended a time, an intentional time, I sat for about 20 minutes with my legs kind of sort of crossed. I'm uh, long legs and kind of stiff. So I did my best. It was not a lotus position, but I stared at that wall for 20 minutes, at the end of which, I think I expected fireworks, John. There, there weren't any fireworks, but I have to say this, is I committed to do it the next day. There was something there, it wasn't fireworks. And uh, I didn't really stop, I just continued. That's, that's when I started, so it was that, 43 years ago. Um, within a couple of years, I was now shifting my research in graduate school, my doctoral dissertation, was with Ken Wilber and Jack Cornfield and uh, Roger Walsh's um, 
friend, Dean Shapiro, it was working with these people. If you and I had been hanging out together, we'd work together on it. I had the most amazing, uh, Jim Finley was on my committee. Jim Finley was the first student in the history of Fuller. He was invited to Fuller because of his work as a student, he was invited. He was a couple of years behind me. He's the first time Fuller let a student be on a dissertation committee because Jim knew more about my dissertation, which was on mindfulness meditation, than the whole rest of the university combined. And so Jim was on my dissertation. So you can imagine the, the incredible vortex that was for me. But it was my immersion then into doing it. It was no longer reading about it. And the doing of it, I want to get back to your, your comment about content. It's beautiful contemplation. I began to learn to do something I've never done, which is to relax the stranglehold that my mind at least tried to have on everything that moved and begin to settle into something that was underneath that or above that or through that. John, I remember in the early years, I remember reflecting to myself, oftentimes I would finish my meditation. I don't think I've ever told you this. I would finish my meditation, the image, the image that would come to me, it's going to sound odd, but it just rose up out of the experience. I used to think if somebody were to come in the room right now, I'm sitting quietly in this room, if somebody would come in the room and they were to shoot me, the bullet would go right through without hitting anything. That was, it's an odd image, and it might sound macabre, but it wasn't. It was like, that's how open I felt with meditation. I used to compare meditation, that experience of contemplation, used to experience it with uh, sex. I hope that this is okay to talk about, is that I don't believe I've ever had a bad experience with sex in terms of the actual physical act of climax. Well, I feel the same way with meditation. If I, I show up in meditation, that is, if I make myself available to presence, I've never had a bad experience with presence. Wow. And so it's just to say it cuts down to something that's really profound. And I can't imagine my life without my friendship with you, John. I can't imagine my life without my friendship with friends like Jim Finley all these years. I can't imagine my life without the impact of Ken Wilber. And it's certainly, it's inconceivable. It is absolutely inconceivable. I could burst into tears to imagine my life without the impact of contemplative prayer. However, one decides that. At this point, my contemplative prayer centers around my swimming every morning. You know that I'm an active boy. I've been a drummer my whole life. I've been a, an athlete my life. I was a tournament tennis player when I was younger, when my body would handle it. By the time you and I got around to it, I was just falling on over myself on the court. But I've always been very active. And uh, I've done a lot of sitting. Uh, in the last number of years, I'd say the last five years, most of my meditation, I learned this from Thich Nhat Hanh, first of all, with walking meditation. And, uh, and I don't know that anybody's written about this, but I experienced this even at Fuller. I used to go to the YMCA and I would swim every morning for an hour. And there was something about that chlorine filled <laughs> ritual. It was in the basement of a YMCA inside that uh, I felt like there was something to that. It would move me into a state that running used to do for me. Drumming does for me as guitar playing does for you. Now swimming again after almost, well, it's been over 40 years. I swim every morning with my wife, Colleen, up at the local community pool. Uh, I spend five minutes, I, I spend about 10 minutes just in silence. I go to the jacuzzi first. I take uh, my dessert before dinner. I sit in the jacuzzi for 10 minutes and I just open myself. There's very few people there at the early hour that we go. And then I go swimming and the ritual is that I spend 10 minutes, the first 10 minutes of swimming, which is five lengths of this Olympic sized pool, um, memorizing poetry, and you know my love for poetry. That's, uh, this, this morning I'm working on Rilke, a very extended passage from Rilke's uh, book. Uh, it's uh, Letters to a Young Poet for me, ranks up there with the Bible and the Tao Te Ching. It's just holy writ to me. So I'm just, I've memorized a whole section of it. Uh, and so I do that for 10 minutes every morning, and then I move into forgiveness practice, and that's for five minutes. Um, and I give the bulk of my swimming, I swim for 20 minutes straight. So that's 15 minutes left. I give the bulk of my swimming to what we're going to talk about, uh, what this new release is about, which is gratitude. I spend 15 minutes every morning in gratitude, and I did this morning. <laughs> well, that is so amazing. You've never quite explained your swimming practice to me in those terms. That's a, that's a whole book there or something. That's a beautiful, Bob. 
Yeah, thank you. I, yeah, yeah. It's you know I can't imagine my life without contemplative prayer, nor can I imagine my life without the forgiveness practice. John, I've told you this before. When we created the Freedom of Forgiveness, um, as a psychologist by background, I, I know a fair bit about shame. I wrote papers. I actually wrote a book chapter on shame before I actually realized that I was swamped in it. And there's actually in the literature this idea of shame about shame is that right. we don't talk about it. It's like how how very un-American to talk about feeling ashamed. Well, if, I, you were, I, if you were a good man, you wouldn't feel bad, something like exactly, that. Exactly, and you're exactly. worse for feeling bad. Yeah. 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 And I and I ascribe to that. So I don't have to point my finger at anybody. I ascribe to that. So the last 10 years plus of forgiveness practice, I tell people this is that I now see, I saw fairly early on in my recovery that I probably spent 90% 90 of the time feeling like shit about myself, feeling ashamed of myself, feeling like there's something broken, defective, unhelpable, all of those things. And so I say 90% of the time, that's a rough estimate, probably an underestimate. And I can say, if you just move forward a little over a decade now, I spend probably 10% of my time in shame, which is to say I'm vulnerable to it. I sometimes I tell people, if, if somebody wants to shame the heck out of me, they can probably do it because I've got hooks for the projections. Right. But I work so much on it that I feel, I actually have the chills in my body now, which indicate to me the truth of what I'm telling you. I could just easily cry as I've been freed of the shackles that that image that Doug Prater created for freedom of forgiveness of the unshackling of the one who's been enslaved. That's me, that's me. Um, and what I want to say is, in addition to that, gratitude has opened up for me. You know, I did a deep dive a couple of years ago into the Stoics. I spent a whole year studying Marcus Aurelius, just very gradually. Um, turns out that I went to college with a student that translated Marcus Aurelius and Seneca and Epictetus for uh, a book and a, I guess there's a, a website, The Daily Stoic. I went to school with that guy. We 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 missed each other because I was probably on a different wavelength, but we were there at the same time. And I mentioned that because there's something about the zeitgeist. There's something about Marcus Aurelius and the Stoics that probably hit him and me at the same time. And what I find valuable, most valuable in Marcus Aurelius that relates to this gratitude practice is he has this idea of amor fati, uh, which is literally love of one's fate, amor fati, Latin for right. love of one's fate. And what it does is it moves beyond psychology to me. Psychology would talk a lot about, think of Kubler-Ross, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, that the final stage of grieving is acceptance. And I think there's a lot of uh, wisdom and value. I had a professor that was a, a student of hers, and he conveyed to me what she was like, and she was an incredibly powerful figure. Uh, she's had a lot of influence on, on uh, not just psychology, but the lay public writ large. But I've always felt like that, that was there was something missing. And Marcus Aurelius provides that because he says it's not acceptance of one's fate. Oh, this is my fate. Okay. Um, my former wife, who was Irish by background, said there was an Irish saying that she learned from her grandfather, what can't be cured must be endured. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> that, that that would be kind of lay stoicism, and I feel like there's got to be some there's 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 something strong about that, but there's got to be something beyond that. And Marcus Aurelius says it's not about accepting your fate; it's about embracing your fate. Yeah. And I think I think that the gratitude practices help me, John. You know the darkness of my particular fate and how it's unfolded. I still pinch myself some mornings and go, "Is this is." Is this my life? How did this happen? I think amor fati, this idea of gratitude for one's fate, this idea of embracing your fate. What's changed for me, John, is that I moved from the utter shame and devastation of not only rank addiction, but losing my career as a professor and as a psychologist. I've moved over this last decade from ru only ruining that, only fighting against that, to moving towards increasing acceptance. I stopped fetching about it. I stopped complaining about it. To realizing now that in God's wisdom, or however you understand the universe, there's been a thread throughout all of this that required this for me, apparently. And would I go back to who I was 10 years ago or 20 years ago? There's no way, John. And again, my body responds with the chills. It's I'm so incredibly grateful. I hate that what 
I had to experience caused others so much pain. My wife, my daughter, friends of my life like you, the pain of that, uh, students of mine, clients of mine, that's extremely painful to me. I won't ever forget that. That keeps me very close to humility for sure. But having said that, there was no way for me to get to where I needed to get to. I think because I came in with such a sizable shadow, it was going to take a, a monumental uh, uh, atomic uh, explosion, and it happened in my life. But it got my attention, thank goodness, uh, and it delivered me into where, where I now, now am. And God willing, I'll be given a few more years to contribute from this. And so I really do feel amor fati. I, I at the end of the day, I sometimes I'll have nightmares because I still have PTSD from all I've been through. Yep. But in, in, in waking life, what I'm doing is cultivating an appreciation. And it's not just a stoic, what can't be cured must be endured. It's like, thank you, God, for exactly what you've created here. You've created this earthly tabernacle inside my life through which you can be manifest. And, and it, this is my particular contribution to evolution. Just came in this form. <laughs> You know, I was reading, I was reading uh, my practice this morning, some Meister Eckhart, which is a, I think he's born in 1268, and he was a great Christian contemplative and mystic, and he was on trial toward the end of his life because, well, the Catholic Church was in a very unstable place, and mystics, people with a direct experience of God, were really not trusted very much because, you know, you have all the rules and all the structures, but if you just, you know, you find God, uh, do you still need all that stuff? That's a really dangerous question. So they put him on trial and and he, he died before, you know, they could do a sentence. And he's been kind of reaccepted uh, mostly by the church, John Paul II. And anyway, but this is what he said. He said, if there were only one prayer you could do in your life, and that was thank you, that would suffice. That would suffice. Meister Eckhart. I love Meister Eckhart. I've got a whole section of books right here. These are all Meister Eckhart. Yeah. And I didn't know that quote till right now. I'm deeply touched by it. I love him. And he's my he's probably my my favorite of the Western tradition of those yeah. that are of contemplatives for sure. And his story in some ways is parallel. He was disgraced, you know, excommunicated, all of that. Probably would have been burnt at the stake if he had lived. And and thank goodness that he that he passed. But that's so beautiful. Think about that is that he articulates, he talks about God beyond God. It's like, is there a way for us to get beyond our attachment to ideas and rituals and forms and institutions and move into what you're talking about, John, what we're talking about today, which is contemplative presence in the presence of, in his words, he, he framed it in terms of the God beyond God. He said, we need to take leave of God, take leave of all of our ideas and move beyond that. And, and it's offered us that he's offered us the formula right here. One prayer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's beautiful. And, and Bob, why, why, why do you think, and, and we'll get back to this, this thing that we're, we want people to experience is your, you know, your gratitude prayer, the, the guided meditation and the entrainment music. But why is it so important for those of us you know, who go through life with open hearts and, 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 and the sadness and the grief, our own individual and looking at the world, why is it, and I guess it goes back to your more fati, you know, that goes back to that, but why is that so important to say thank you? Just, um, it's very moving, and I'm, I'm feeling, uh, feeling a lot of stuff as I'm saying this, and I just got off a call before this with some of my Ukrainian friends, you know, and and what they're going through in their country. Beautiful, beautiful people. And uh, Amor Fate, thank you, God. You know, um, you know, Jesus said when he was he was getting ready to be crucified in Gethsemane, you know, I mean, according to the story, he knew it was going to happen. So he said, you know, if you could take this cup from me, please do it, you know, but nevertheless, thy will be done, you know, do what needs to be done. And amen and thank you. That's a heck of a thing. You know, John, when I was a freshman in college, I took a speech class. I was always uh, nervous about uh, speaking in, in public, and I took a speech class. And uh, I think there was some something inside of me that knew I was going to spend most of my career teaching in front of people. And uh, 
what a what a fate. Speaking of amor fati, I mean, I I never got over being nervous. I still am nervous speaking in front of people. I, I I'm so grateful to do it, but I still I never have gotten over my nerves. Anyway, so I took this class and we were asked to give a oral interpretation was one of the speeches. Every every couple of weeks we were required to give a speech. He had us memorize them. We weren't allowed to have notes. And the speech I selected were the last words of Jesus on the cross. This was me at the really height of my fidelity to, I think, Christian orthodoxy. But it was it was a very personal thing for me, as it was for you. This was not some kind of like uh, 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 plate that I put on myself. It was really meaningful to me. And so I never forget uh, sharing, uh, and I can't remember now if it was out of the Gospel of Matthew or the Gospel of, of I, I think it was the Gospel of Matthew, but... Jesus is on the cross and he says, he says, uh, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. He says, he says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And I wanted to finish the speech, but right then, the college I was going to, a bell rang between classes and the whole class kind of burst out into nervous laughter. I'll never forget this. And we kind of waited for things to settle down. And then I continued. For some reason, it came up when you're talking about this, because right in the middle of, of this huge tragedy, of, of, of the, the, uh, the, the bell rings, and it brings in another element, even the bell ring, which is that he, Jesus is completely identified with us in terms of despair. Yeah. Think of the, think of the Ukrainians right now, and all of us that care about what's happening in Ukraine. And then he says, into thine hands I commend my spirit, is that there's a sense of yielding. And I think that that's what Meister Eckert's talking about. He's not talking about when you're having a good day. He's talking about when you're on a cross. And there's something about that move. John, right before we met today, I've been puzzling this morning over the use of the word comedy in this. This is Dante's Divine Comedy. And so I looked up comedy in terms of literature, I was trying to understand how do they mean this? And most of it references humor. So, well, I don't think of the divine comedy like the inferno as being humorous. So it's not, it's not, it's not yuck yuck, that's for sure. No. And so they introduced this idea of tragic comedy. And though they didn't comment, comment it, I read a few different articles this morning on comedy. Um, what Dante means is, is what Christ's life was, which is a tragic figure who's crucified or taken down, who emerges uh, through resurrection, that, 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 there's, that there's a so-called happy ending to the story. I, I don't say that lightly, that there's transformation. And I think that, that thank you is, is choosing for the door that leads to transformation. There was there was a there was a psychologist. She's a psychoanalyst in Germany uh, during the time of the Third Reich, and she escaped as did Freud and his daughter to London uh, just in the nick of time. They 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 escaped because they would have been they would have, they would have died. Yeah, they were Jewish. They would have killed them. Her name was Melanie Klein, and Melanie Klein held up in London, and she became known as the the uh, the godmother really of child psychoanalysis. Her focus was on working with children. She worked with all ages, though, and one of the observations that she made is relevant to this question of thank you, and it's come up for me in 45 years of clinical work myself, is that she said that most clients come in with a certain attitude about their problem in their life, and she says over half the battle won is getting them to move from what she called the first position to the second position. The first position, again, this is observed from, from somebody who knew about suffering firsthand, she would have been joined right there as, as you are with the Ukrainians. I mean, she, she knew firsthand the loss was incredible. The, the first position she called the paranoid schizoid position, which is a long flutin' term, but it's easy to understand it. Paranoid means I'm looking outside of myself. I'm vigilant, looking to be, looking to be had. That's paranoid. And schizoid means I'm cut off. I'm cut off from others because I'm paranoid about them. I'm also cut off from myself because I'm always on edge. But they're, they're, I'm never really able to settle down into a deeper place. And that was Jesus in position one. When he thank said, you. My, I my never Lord, thought I have not forsaken me. That's position one. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful. John, we're going to write an article on this one. That's beautiful. That's brilliant. The second position that Melanie Klein came up with, and I've 
Since thought that there might be a third position that she didn't write about, but they're, they're coextensive. The second position, she said, is you move from that first position, which is being a victim and being on red alert all the time. The second position is you move into a place of grief. You move into a place of grief. And that's Jesus into thy hands. I come in my spirit. Um, it's, a, it's a grief. It's an acceptance. And she, if the first the first position is the paranoid schizoid. I'm paranoid about what's going on, and I'm cut off from others and myself. The second position, she picked a term that requires unpacking. She just picked the term, it's the depressive position. But she didn't mean clinical depression. She meant grief. And it gets so mixed up in our culture. John, you know a lot about both, and I do too. And, and I know that when I'm depressed, I can't grieve. Depression actually cuts me off from grief. With depression, I feel flat. Grief is actually feeling, and there's a there's a vitality to it. It's a dark vitality. Depression won't allow me to go anywhere. I'm just stuck in uh, flatland, basically. If there's a third uh, corollary to that, it would be amor fati, is that beyond moving from a victimized position to a position of acceptance, and she says that, that turn, by the way, is over half the work in therapy. If you can get somebody to move from the first position to the second position, then whatever problem they have, now you have, you have you have the possibility of dealing with it from a perspective that might make for transformation. What did Einstein say? Um, the problems that we have today won't be solved by the same mindset or the, the same view that created them. She, she totally ascribed to that. You can't solve a problem from the victimized paranoid schizoid position because you'll just be locked into that forever. That's the 10,000 things. You must transform. And that transformation means that you can approach whatever it is that you suffer with physically or psychologically. You've got a deep enough standpoint. And I would only add to that uh, embracing one's fate. That would be that. And that's, that's saving the heart. I think Jesus models that into thy hands. I commend my spirit. I mean, it's just, it, it, uh, that's, I think that that's what he's suggesting. I think that's what the Buddha is suggesting in terms of absenting ourselves of ourselves and, and choosing for radical presence and radical compassion. So if there's a tragic comedy, it's human then, isn't it? Even though this, this material on gratitude, John, has was born out of my own recovery, you know this, and I think that we're on similar pages here. I look at recovery as being universal, as human. My, my attraction or my allegiance to refuge recovery is it posits recovery in terms of the four noble truths of Buddhism. And what's the first noble truth is that all existence suffers. We all suffer. There's, it isn't just addicts that suffer. We all suffer. And, and what is that suffering? Well, it's our attachment to things or our aversion to things. Now we're in the domain of addiction. I happen to get addicted to alcohol and other drugs. John, you know that I've been in sobriety now for over 10 years. That's just, those, those are just a couple of my addictions. I've got all kinds of other attractions and aversions or attachments and aversions. And I review them every morning. I haven't told you about this. It'll be embodied in the, the, the material, the gift of gratitude, and you've reviewed it, is that I start off every morning with what the uh, 12 step tradition would call moral inventory. I just go through the various things that I'm, that I'm attached to. And I've got about a half a dozen things uh, actually, I have seven things, the magnificent seven, the not so magnificent seven that I deal with every day. I, I, I review every day. How am I doing with these, these threads in my life that they end up, those end up becoming friends to me, John. The, yeah. the very things that are my symptoms, symptoms of attachment or aversion, let's say, addiction, uh, the things that keep me uh, uh, in, in servitude. When those get activated for me, I know that I've got work to do. It's almost like a, 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 a canary in a coal mine. It reminds me that there's a problem here. And then I move from that into my gratitude practice. But I start every morning with what people would call a moral inventory. I stop feeling, it, it feels like it's part of my gratitude. It's going to sound weird, but it's like, okay, I just, I just bought something that I don't need. Uh, and I have a history of doing that. What's going on? It's like that becomes a friend to me. It becomes a symptom that lets me know. I just, I just 
uh, bit myself into a pretzel with somebody, which, as you know me, has been a long-term thing. What's going on? What must I do to address that? There actually is a, I start my gratitude practice with this, which for some people might be off-putting, but it's actually inviting the darker aspects of our shadow in as part of the gratitude. And I do it every morning. All I do, John, is I review the previous 24 hours. I don't ever have to go far to find things that, that, need to be fine-tuned. It doesn't feel burdensome to me because the out the uh, the result of this is liberation. And how can liberation be burdensome? Right. And those pretzels, those issues that we all have that you're talking about, actually, as they begin to unwind, have energy for transformation. Yeah. Thank you. To kick into that next level you, uh, of where you. we're just there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I don't have to go very far. I can look at this morning's meditation and I won't share the specifics out of respect to my privacy. Isn't that nice of me to say that? But I will say this as I worked on it, I could feel energy open. Um, John, I wake up in the morning. You and I have talked about this before. I wake up in the morning. I get up early, but I wake up in the morning a big grump. I don't wake up. I don't wake up clicking my heels. Up. I'm just going to say ever. I'm from Texas. I can exaggerate, right? I, I just never wake up. Uh, uh, you know, uh, at, at, at uh, uh, bright and shiny, was it bright and bushy tailed? Um, but by the time I finish my quiet time, I have an hour of quiet time before I go to meditate at the pool. So I have a couple of hours every morning, and I know that you share a similar dedication to practice. This is how I set the tone for every day. By the time I'm in the pool and working on this stuff, I've already been up and working stuff in my journaling and in my prayer and in my. Uh, uh, my reading and so on, is that there is a release of energy. There is a release of energy, and I felt it this morning. And what I want to say is that by the time I get out of the pool, it's like by the time I finish meditating, I'm always better for having given those couple of hours each morning. I'm always better. And it, it, and I think about it, this is a phrase that you get sometimes in the 12-step groups, and you've heard it, John, you probably taught it to me, is that my worst day in sobriety is better than my best day in rank addiction. That's true, is I, I can start with a pretty low baseline on a given day. I'm better for having meditated and then better for all of that, living a life that's committed to successful, sustained recovery. I just, what is, it, what is it that we're recovering? We're recovering our birthright, right? And I lost my birthright probably at birth. <laughs> it took me all of my life to begin to regain a relationship to it, and I'm not nearly done. There's a phrase in the 12-step program that we're works in progress, progress, not perfection. I, 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 I'm, as long as I'm kicking, I plan to keep working and reading and all the rest of that. And so what a gift to me. So why wouldn't I be grateful for this? Why wouldn't I be grateful for this life? <laughs> so, Bob, how do we use this now? This is volume one. There's more later that it's going to be more specifically for people in recovery yeah. as my understanding of it but so you get up then what do you do how do you use this thing yeah, yeah. let me suggest a a, a a user's guide just real quickly is is john I, I i suggest that 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 anybody that's interested in this listen to the material first of all as i was introduced to material as i mentioned earlier early in my recovery whatever form whatever you've read about gratitude use all of that but listen to this material and then begin immediately to adapt and i even include this in the the audio the audio material is this to be adapted and customized to the individual what i did at some point this is years ago uh, because my background's in psychology and I've been immersed in, among other uh, people's work, Abraham Maslow's work in psychology, it's well familiar to, to many in the lay public. I began utilizing Maslow's hierarchy and just as my gratitude practice, I go through each element of his hierarchy. It's simple enough. He starts with your physical health and I, that's very robust for me. Then he moves from that into safety and security and I Go into that, and I go into detail of all this stuff in, in the uh, the recorded material. I move from that into relationships, what Maslow called belongingness. I move from that into what he calls self esteem, which for me is centered around my uh, making a difference in the world, my contributing, my work in the day. I go through my entire day each morning before I go into my day. 
Um, and then I finished with self-actualization and for that matter, self-transcendence, which are the last two of those phases. So I go through that hierarchy. I recommend that, that anybody listen to that and just begin to improvise on it. I, it continues to ramify and work and change. It's a living piece for me. It's, it, I, there's no reason to do any of this by rote. I don't do one piece of this practice by rote. I wait until I experience, like you were saying about that feeling of energy, I wait until I until I feel in my body, in my being, the truth of what it is I say. I've gotten to where I can do it quickly. The, the CD is however long, let's say 30 minutes, and I take 15 minutes to do it, and you could do it probably more quickly, except I'm, I'm worried about turning around at the end of each lane that I swim and stuff, so there's interruptions. But I, I recommend doing it whatever matches your your uh, your biorhythms. Morning is good for me. I don't wake up great, but morning is good for me. I think people are different. My wife, Colleen, is a night person. She she does her her quiet time meditation at night. That's fine. I zonk out at night. I'm too, I'm too pooped at night to do this. And so you want to find where your energy and your creativity and your openness um, are, are can be maximized. I will going to recommend something that's going to sound heavy duty, maybe for some, but I absolutely, mean, I recommend doing it every day without, without exception, which I don't turn this into a legalism that we need that like we need a hole in the head. But for me, I want to develop, and you know this, I've learned this from you, dedication to meditation practice writ large and to this particular practice. You won't experience, remember how I talked about sitting in front of that wall and meditating, no fireworks. I don't, I don't think most people are going to experience fireworks doing this once. You do this for a week, or like John Cabot Zen talks about, just do this for six weeks. I tell clients, just try this for six weeks. At the end of six weeks, if you don't experience any difference, let's move on to plan B. But give it some time. And, and in my case, give it 11 years, and you are a different person at a molecular level. I'm not the same person I was last year, uh, much less 11 years ago. There's no way that I'm the same person. So I recommend uh, uh, finding your own form, uh, investing in that, practicing it daily and seeing what comes. If we have a built-in negativity bias in our brains, which is what biologists say that we do, I think it's possible to turn that around. I think it is possible to rub your tummy and pat your head at the same time. I think it's possible to be a human being and experience more and more gratitude as you default. And I'm working on that. I have my days where I'm, I'm caught in negativity. I just last week, here's an example. Last week, I had a lean week clinically and I rely on my clinical work to provide the income that makes it possible for me to write and present and be here with you and all these other things. Very grateful to every client that pays me uh, for me to do work with them. Typically it's around recovery coaching. So I had a lean week last week. I was in the pool, John, and I was in my quiet time before I started swimming and I was reflecting on this and, and in kind of a, a bitchy mode, this, this really sucks. And then it hit me, John, this is an example of how for the default can change. I realized that last Wednesday, I had a national webinar. I had a deadline for a second uh, workshop due last week for uh, September in, uh, it's going to be at UCLA. And I had a third deadline, which was around the book uh, project I'm working on with our friend Guy Duplessis. All of these things converged last week. And just that realization moved from, from complaining about it I'm embarrassed to tell you this, but it's the truth, to just absolute gratitude and in some ways kind of shaking my head at how small my vision can be. Oh, I'm so sad that I'm not working enough this week. And it's like, I, I told Colleen after we finished throwing, that's my wife. I told Colleen, I said, I told her about this. There was complete figure ground reversal and it never went back, John. It just went like that. It just was radical all the way through my entire being to realize, thank you, benevolent cosmos for providing me such, such a time that I could dedicate myself to this so that I didn't drive myself to the brink of physical breakdown, which I've done so much in my life, just work myself into a frenzy, much less the psychology, you know, the stress of it all. I was delivered from that, but it, it was delivered into gratitude. That's when you begin to see it, where you'd find yourself going to the path of leap resistance into negativity and something course corrects. And that something is purely graced. That awareness was purely grace because I'm really familiar with complaining about my lot. <laughs> it was like, not only did it change in that moment, but it changed all week till today. It just, it's like, 
that was a way yeah. out. <laughs> and you, you can feel and listening and, and practicing, and we always talk about practice, with just repetition, repetition, in order to cultivate something that's really important. In this, yeah. in this case, yeah. gratitude or a spiritual life or okayness with being incarnated and doing this human thing that we're doing right now in the world. But you can feel you can feel that it's a living practice for you. You know, this is not something you made up to do a, you know, do a track or something. This is coming right from the center of your heart. And uh, it's, that's why it's so beautiful. It's so, it's so powerful. John, you know this with freedom of forgiveness. It was also a case for gift of gratitude. I don't live, I don't live, nor do I have easy access to a uh, silent sound, you know, sound studio, like a studio setting. You know, I've played in the studio, but I don't have access to that. And so in both this, uh, in both uh, the, the case of gift of gratitude, but also freedom of forgiveness, the, the most silent place I could find in my house was Colleen's walk-in closet with clothes everywhere. I mean, it's, you know, hanging. So it's relatively dampened. The, the, you know, it's pretty quiet. So I went in there and because it's a closet, I don't know. I just closed the door and it's just pitch dark. And so I just spoke from my experience. I spoke from my heart. And there may be hesitancies, and I may trip over a word here and there, but I just moved into this place that we're talking about, which is uh, is a kind of a contemplative presence open to whatever comes through. It was unscripted, and it would be different if I did it today as opposed to when I did it a few weeks or months ago. It comes out of my own experience. John, I've learned this from you around practice. This is you, You're the avatar of this to me in my life is that you remember that incredible book that Ken Wilber wrote all those years ago uh, with his wife upon her passing, uh, Grace and Grit. And I, I still remember reading that. I was flying back from England to the United States. I read the entire book and just wept my eyes out on that flight. I was so moved by this. It's right there in the title. And you, you're fond of using this word of grit. It came to me just this last week, John. Uh, I was sharing this with Colleen. My own therapist over the years is a Jungian analyst, Don Sloggy. I'm writing a book right now about our work together. Don was in analysis. His mentor was Ed Edinger, who was sometimes seen as the dean of Jungian analysts in America when he was alive. And Ed Edinger's analyst was Carl Jung. So the lineage is Carl Jung, Ed Edinger, Don Sloggy. And then I get to be the recipient of all of this. <clears throat> Don sh shares with me from time to time what Ed taught him. Uh, he and Ed had a very profound uh, connection. When Ed passed, Don was the speaker at his funeral. Ed said, he said, it's not, it doesn't belong to you. And it refers to our lives. It doesn't belong to you. And you're fully responsible. That to me is, 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 is what I've gotten from you, John, which was equal parts grace. It doesn't belong to us, this life of ours. It doesn't look at what we've been given. And we're fully responsible. There's the grit. And it's both of those. And so this practice for me combines both of those. I, we're talking about responsibility. We're talking about grit of doing it when you get up in the morning and you may not feel like it or at the end of the day when you may be, be doing it. And the fact is, is what does it open us into? It opens it, or it makes us available to grace, makes us available to grace. And what is gratitude? But just an acknowledgement of grace. <laughs> yeah, and, and the great athletes talk about a phrase I've heard a lot in the last few years is embracing the grind. You know, embracing yeah. the practice is like, you know, yes, this is this is where it gets real. And I just love it. I'm gonna do it. I'm not gonna get over. I don't if I yeah, I just wish I didn't have to practice or whatever. Just embrace it. And and from that, grace comes from that, from that grit and that grind, and it begins to this thing that you don't own, but you're responsible for begins to transmit light or light can flow through it more easily. And okay, thank you. Thank you. That's why I'm here. Thank you. And uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> I can't think of anything better to say to end our conversation than that, John. It's just beautiful. It's, it echoes the words of Meister Eckhart. It echoes what I've learned from you, John. I'm so grateful for you in my life. I'm so grateful. You've been so absolutely key to all that, that, that has come my way these last 10 years. At some point, <clears throat> I was thinking about, I wish I hadn't gotten addicted. And I did this, John, and it was part of my gratitude practice. I did some journaling one day after my gratitude practice. I went down the list of the people that I would never have gotten to know were it not for my uh, the, the depths of the valley that I entered into. And that valley lasted for 15 years. <clears throat> 
at the top of the list is you, John. I would never have met you. I came to you, I, you, know, you know I got into recovery and I was desperate for some perspective that was as multifaceted as Ken Wilber's and I couldn't find it. And talk about the heavens opening up, your book had just come out. And I, if it had been five years earlier, well, if it had been, well, if it had been earlier, I wouldn't have found it, nor would I have met you and look at, look at, we've been together this entire period of time, you've been on my life and I'm so incredibly grateful. So thank you, John. Thank you for your support, uh, your, your support from you and Pan together. <clears throat> we talked about this recently. The two of you supported me in a time where I felt so much I was very early in my work and I felt so much judgment from outside. And frankly, I think most of it was coming from inside. And you guys did nothing to support that judgment that I had going on inside. You guys countered it. In fact, I told you this, Pam, Pam checked to make sure I was gonna be responsible, to make, make sure I'm gonna be responsible. And uh, it's been your encouragement. This helped me to be equal parts grace and grit these last uh, these last years. So John, thank you for this opportunity. Yeah, Bob, love you and, and thank you for doing all the work and, and passing your the grace received from your grit and embracing the grind in your life. It's it's huge. And yeah, guys, check this out and give it a shot, you know, embrace it, love it, and uh, and be grateful. And things are going to emerge from that that are truly um, hope-inducing, life-enhancing, and you'll find your feet back on your path that sometimes we fall off of and uh it's why we practice it's why we do it bob love you brother thank you so much you too brother lots of love to you thank you thank you <laughs>